Hi hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Megan Milchark, I'm the Head of Education and Assessment for NFLUX, and I am your Head of Customer Success, and I have here with me my colleague Robin. Hi, I'm Robin Logan, I'm Head of Business Intelligence Analytics. Happy to have you here with us this afternoon. Um, looking forward to talking with everybody here. Yeah, so we're going to um, try something a little bit different this time. Robin and I are really going to run this more as a sort of chat style um, fireside chat. You can see we both brought up our fireplaces as our backgrounds um, to just kind of bring uh, a little bit of a different feel to it. And part of this came out of when we were developing this webinar. We really felt that some of the benefit was just talking to each other and talking through some of these concepts. Robin has a ton of experience in institutional research and dealing with data from sort of that database and backend view and really just like what you can get out of your data if you build it properly as we all know and then you know um, robin sort of understanding or picking my brain on how we use that data on the uh, outcome side of things so we just found a lot of value in that we thought it would be really fun to do it that way so just hang with us as we try this new format out and we're available via the chat, the Q&A, and certainly at the time we're going to, at the end, we're going to leave time for questions. So I will share my screen and we will get started. All right, looks like everybody can see. So we call this Organizing Data-Driven Excellence for Semesters End and Accreditation Compliance which is really sort of our long way of saying that we're talking about like the best ways that you can build your systems and build your data so that when it comes time to comply with accreditation, it's as simple as pressing a couple buttons, viewing a dashboard and pulling out the insights because you've done everything you needed to do all along the way. Right, Robin? Exactly. Exactly. So we love all that pre-work. Absolutely. So a little bit of housekeeping, everybody except for Robin and I, you're muted today. Um, use the Q&A to ask questions or send us feedback at any time. The recording will be available afterwards. It will be sent to your email inboxes. And if you had a colleague that said, I can't make it, make sure you get me the recording, they will get it as well if they have registered. Um, and then as we're chatting, just um, go ahead, write in where you're from and the institution that you represent. We always love seeing where our customers are coming from. Again, we talked about who we are. And so why does this matter? You know, before we even get into anything, we kind of like to position what is the importance of all of this. We do this with our students and we talk to them about why we're learning a lesson that day. So it's important we tell you why all of this matters for you. So for us, it's what we put in that determines our output. We, I think we all know that term garbage in, garbage out. Um, and you can see my little examples here of where we take garbage sometimes that we know is garbage and we try to make it better than it really is, right? So we have our little Dilbert comic here with a manager who's willing to overlook bad data, put up a firewall in their brain and say, I'm going to ignore the fact that this is bad, that I've put lipstick on a pig or spray painted something to make it look better and more valuable than it really is, spray painted it in gold. Yeah. Robin, do you have anything here? <laughs> It is, it is so very true, you know, how many times we just think, oh, I'll deal with it later, you know, yeah. I'm not going to worry about it right now, and how much we actually get in our own way by not just taking a few seconds and thinking about how we want to use it in the first place and making sure that what we have is actually good. Yeah, and, uh, you know, if you've ever neglected your folding your laundry for more than a week, you know how quickly things can pile up if you don't do it the right <laughs> way. <laughs> At least I do. <laughs> yeah, you are so, anyway. so correct. <laughs> So from my, my point of view, the commonly asked questions that I get that really tie Robin's point of view and my point of view together are, why can't I look at things longitudinally? Or can I look at longitudinal data coming from my curriculum, coming out of my students? Can I correlate outcomes and grades or whatever indicator I'm looking for? Why doesn't X data look right? It looked this way before, it doesn't look this way now. And then the sort of generic, why can't I find? Certainly, sometimes these can be explained by ingestion issues or, you know, occasional missteps here or there. But many times the answer is really data setup, right, Robin? Exactly. And, you know, all of these questions kind of send us on that treasure hunt, you know, on, on everybody's sides. Okay, why, why is it that I can't find a particular course in the course list? 
you know, how is it different from everything else? And why is it just this one particular one? You know, I don't understand. And sometimes it's easier to find than others, you know, and you can spend hours sometimes looking hours for and just rogue data that's that you just you swear it's in there somewhere. <laughs> Yeah. And you're like, do you remember who was employed here three years ago? Do you think they maybe still have access to their Google Drive, right? Like we find that institutional knowledge when it's not organized well, when it's not shared well. Um, like we have all those risks of maybe the data doesn't even exist the way that we thought it did anymore because it was in somebody's drive and they're moved exactly. on from the institution. Right? And, then, and then because of retention policy or permission policies, that data doesn't exist anymore. And then, oh, my goodness, what do you do on the assessment side? Yeah, right. So thinking <laughs> those things through, like the accreditors. Oh, are my goodness. Yeah, it can't be like, well, Megan left the institution seven years ago and she took that paper with her. Right. Like we need we no. need to make sure that we're doing our due diligence there. Know it. All right. This one is all yours, ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, thinking about how our data gets into the systems, um, some of us are lucky enough to have these what what I call auto magical loads, you know, these things that just happen, you know, uh, somebody somewhere in in your institution has taken the time to make sure that the, the data is connected if it's between Canvas and your student information system or ExamSoft or whatever the case may be. And that is beautiful. Um, and it's kind of out of sight, out of mind, never had to worry about it kind of thing. But think about it for a minute. There might be changes that you're unaware of that do affect the quality of the data. Sometimes the most, probably the most frequent one that we see happening is with the student names. Um, like for some reason, all of a sudden you might get uh, tag codes at the very beginning of a student ID. We're used to an institutional, um, what, what I would refer to as a PITM, and maybe it's yeah. one, two, three, four, five, six, and now it's like S two zero one two three four five six for oh. you know some kind of institutional tag, or maybe it's changed to their email ID account, you know, from the actual numerical PITM or something like that. Um, and if you're not on top of that and aware of that, then when you're looking later in the system you're wondering well why doesn't this student show a particular i'm, I'm filtered to student one two three four five six and it's because that record is not actually under a different student record and we have to take processes to merge those together so there could be so you're saying duplications there could yes. be two, two megan Miltrarics that are both me exactly but just two different ids on them and now my data is not connected to each other exactly and that exactly so you kind of have to be aware of you know what changes are happening on the university in the data and you know loads change from time to time and so just be aware on the front side before it's too late before you know records are like exam records or course records are are actually tied to it and you can affect that change and get everything smooth so you're saying we have to pay attention to that part of the faculty. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> now, for the rest of us that don't have those automatical loads, there's somebody somewhere doing the loads for us. And hopefully there's um, there's process documentation in place as to how this actually happens. You know, people, people change jobs, um, you know, Maybe somebody got busy and they're teaching somebody else how to do it. And then the next person thinks, all well intentioned. Oh, well, this seems too hard. I'll just make it easier. Not realizing that they're missing a step that was very important to make sure that records are, are connected together. Um, and I like to remind people that process documentation is actually also part of assessment as well. Uh, okay, because sure. you can go back and you can say, this is what we did, and this is possibly where it went wrong. So you know what you need to fix or correct and then try it again. Um, you can we even assess that. your process, right? Like it all the time, like with course evaluations. Right. Those were the easiest to just get out of sync a little bit because, oh, you know, well intentioned people doing a really good job, just miss a step here or there. Right. What's the big deal if we just skip X? Right. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah. X is the one that ties people together or ties, <laughs> together or ties faculty together. Yeah. Right. Exactly. 
Right. And then, you know, worst case scenario, um, you've, you're just what I like to call Frankensteining things together. You're pulling a little bit here, a little bit here and a little bit here and saying a prayer and moving on. Right. (laughs) And, you know, we're human. So things are going to happen. So we just need to, to think about how we can protect ourselves. Yeah. So I came from automagical loads from the institutions that I worked in. And so it was a really eye-opening thing for me to talk to our customers who don't have those types of loads and really the, the barriers that it unintentionally creates um, because of the extra work that has to be done. So I've become a big advocate for any time you can convince the other parties and stakeholders in your university to help you do those automatical loads. It really does keep the everything looking the way you want it to across the board. That's so true. That is so true. Yeah. Right. So data integrity versus I like to talk about this one too, because there is a difference between the data integrity and the data quality. Because when you think about data integrity, it's it's how it's stored and how it gets there. Um, And so of course reliability and accuracy, consistency is all part of it. But the best way i think i can exemplify how this affects us is if you've ever done any kind of load of data and you've got beautifully formatted dates um and all of a sudden when you look at it (laughs) it just completely reformatted things maybe you were supposed to have month day and year and it loaded in day month and year or something like that i know or it makes like scientific notation out of it, it like where did exactly, that come from exactly right or zip codes that lose the leading zeros right. um special characters thanks thank you microsoft for autocorrect you know we love auto <laughs> anyway <laughs> but um those when when they introduced special characters in there um, for consistency, we find the Unicode characters actually in our in our data, and so be, it affects how things match together because it's looking for things that are exactly alike. So spaces, characters, capitalization, number formats, date formats, time formats, it all matters. Um, And so we just have to be super careful, you know, with, um, I know with Excel, one of the things that would drive me crazy a lot of times was it would introduce a a carriage return and it would be invisible. You wouldn't, it wouldn't act like a space. It wouldn't act like, it would just be this invisible carriage return that would then mess up any of my, um, my data loads. And I would have to go figure out where those things are. So when you can work with flat files and not send it through something like Excel, there are converters out there um, that you can use that will import your data a little bit better and process that. Now, data quality is the ability to use that data. And so it's, it's more about, is it ready? You know, are all of my dates the same format? You know, do I have, um, do I have anything that I need to correct in the data to make it consistent? So like maybe you've got, I know one of the things in IR your college programs, the academic programs would switch yeah. between colleges and deans. Right. And so, you know, do we need to do anything? Do we need a crosswalk table or something like that where we're not actually changing the data, the original source, because we want to leave that integrity. In sure. There, right. But you want to have a way to say, okay, well, English is now in a different um, answer to a different college and well, here's different how we use it. Yeah, right. whether that's courses, whether that's uh, we will see us do that a lot in the survey data, because it may be it went from a to the. And that right. article is very important because technically the it's question is different. Right. And so, you know, if if the concept of the question hasn't changed in meaning, you'll see us crosswalk those together and use well, the like, yeah. word question, you know. Yeah. And, and so when you're thinking about rubrics, setting up rubrics or surveys, like I said, you know, think about how you're going to use it and how it needs to be crosswalked together. Is it a completely different question? Totally different different meaning, different answers, yeah. or is it just that you're reformatting it enough for, for clarity? 
sake. Right. So a little inside baseball for all of our uh, viewers yeah. here with us is that Robin and I are both share a background as English teachers in a previous <laughs> life. And so really what we're saying here is like the words you use matter, right? So because, you know, not to get on a soapbox and take this mm -hmm. on a different tangent, but there is a difference between <laughs> A and D. There's a difference. There's a meaning difference in those words, right? So making sure that nomenclature naming the way we talk about things stays consistent. And certainly we'll get into that later. Um, but this even goes down to like little areas. And I'm thinking of an argument, not an argument, a debate that was sparked at an institution I was at, which is, you know, when we retrieved that grade data with all of those long number strings after the decimal. How much precision do you actually need? Do you, do you use Excel <laughs> truncation? Do you let Excel <laughs> auto truncate by saying down to two decimals? Or do you manually truncate and round? And believe it or not, that sparked like a two week long email exactly. debate involving all of the faculty administrators because there were diff there were slight differentiations, which in certain student cases, depending on which version you used, made a difference in what grade was given. So right. that pass little, fail just by just did, just by that rounding process. Did they get the B minus or the B? You know, and like that yeah. really does make a difference in how it, the outcomes fall out for our students. So it can seem so small, but actually have a very large impact. Exactly. And so like we listed here is did anything change? How do you know it changed? You know, taking a look, does it make sense? Ask yourself, does it actually make sense? And just to kind of loop back to what you said about policy and procedure, it's not micromanagement, right, mm -hmm. to say this is the way we do things and oh, there's no. a reason for the way we do things. It's micromanagement when there's no reason or when it seems to be personal control, but to say we keep our data looking this way, we're very detailed about it because of these reasons, that is good management. And being very measured when you know that a change needs to occur. Right. That way you can implement it properly and you know that you have to make accommodations downstream in other places as well. Yes. Yes. Oh, these are good numbers. Don't just throw them away. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. Don't let it go away. Yeah, how do you like numbers? <laughs> um, so just a few just a few things to think about. Um, one of my favorite stories is when I like to say it was when I got my first big girl job. I was the receptionist in the financial aid office. Yay. Um, so I would have to check people in and you know, of course I'm may I get your name and, and that. And this one young gentleman came up to the, the counter and he says, Bond, James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> and it was his honest to goodness, it was his <laughs> That is wonderful. <laughs> and, you know, it, that name was picked. Ian Fleming picked that name because he thought it was very boring. <laughs> yeah, that's Untrivial. funny. I mean, I have a nephew named Jackson Brown. So There you, you know. go. There you go. There's there's plenty of, of when you think about um, test cases, mm -hmm. you know, really think about how you are structuring the name of those. Because if you're not careful, those can bleed into your actual data and mess up your outcome information. Yeah, um, I mean, so, I, I like to put the name test right in there, to be exactly, honest. Exactly, yeah. exactly. The same, the same with any assessments that I'm using that I know aren't like real to my course. I'm just testing exam soft, having a fun day, right? Like I call a mock or fun or test, whatever it might be, like put it right in the name so that there's no confusion. Yeah, exactly. I've seen people even use strings of numbers, um, like six nines or something like that as a tag. So just some kind of tag that you know is not going to exist in the real data mm -hmm. uh, so that they're easy to filter out that way. You can tag them, you can, you can do it through scripting or something like that to remove those records if it's consistently done the same way. Yeah. You know, and so you think about other things that um, really kind of make things fall out of your reports you know right. so nulls are a big thing we'll talk about nulls a little bit later on but um that data that we don't record because right. there's a misconception if it's empty there's no data but empty is data mm -hmm. <laughs> um yeah. And so thinking about it that way, and when you fill things in, you know, what is causing a record to land in a different bucket? Um, right. 
you know, at, at some of my prior jobs, I would talk about data in terms of rain raindrops and buckets and where do you want it to fall? So are you basically saying like, you know, if you find nulls, wherever you might find them, don't assume the cause of them, you know, kind of bucket them as nulls for more investigation for root cause and analysis. Initially. Right. And not just to look at it and maybe be like, oh, it's a null. That means that it's a zero or it's a null. That means they didn't grade the assessment yet. Um, right. Don't like make those assumptions without putting it aside and looking at it specifically. Or even if it's categorical as, as you're right. thinking about, you know, um, well, let's go back to the majors, for instance. Maybe you don't know what college English is going to go into yet. You know, and it's between two different right. places. You know, my suggestion would be to leave it in the current one because you know that, and then you can go back and correct it into um, the new, the new location once you know. Right. The answer, right? right. Um, leaving it null creates completely different problems, and things will Correct. disappear, and you may not even realize it. That's that's the problem is. Stuff will fall out and you may not even realize that it's missing until you've already reported it and it's too late and people are using it and you have to go back and you have to say, oh, wait, I missed a chunk of 100 students and that's like significantly important. But then again, if you never realize you even missed the chunk, you know, like we talk about seeing students, we talk about all these initiatives outside of the data, what we do with data. And um, if you don't see the student because you've missed the data, then you are missing student stories, you're missing opportunities to right. reach students, you're missing the true story of your institution that when we know it comes time to talk about what we do to the accreditors, when it comes time to talk about compliance, we have to tell our story. Well, if our story is missing a whole set of our students, it's not a full and complete story. And we're missing those opportunities to either congratulate ourselves and our students for outstanding work that we're not seeing, or we're missing low hanging fruit for opportunities for improvement to assess for impact of changes later on, right? That's right. So those are good numbers. Don't just throw them away. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So we kind of touched on several of these, you know, so think about your terms. You know, when you're setting up terms, many times those, my experience has been that the academic calendars are set into the future. Yeah. You know, so if you already know what those are, go ahead and start loading those in and sure you if a if a date changes by a week or something like that you can go back in and reset those um rotation dates um the rotation locations um category tags if you know a standard is changing or something like that you know that you need to to do those categorical changes in exam soft right or um, even just to help us help you Right, you know, exactly. uh, you, you know your exam dates, you have a rotational schedule that's very clear with blocks, for example, you're a Wednesday exam block for exactly. a school. Let us know, we can run your ingestions on Thursdays so that you're getting your data by the end of the week instead of waiting till Monday, right? Um, exactly. You know, let us know about your cohort updates or your new student groups, and then we're able curriculum to kind of get ahead of it. This is a big one. When you're thinking about having to do a curriculum map, you yeah. know, why are we teaching what we're teaching? You know, are we teaching what we say we were going to teach? Right. You know, how do you show that? You, there on campus, I'm sure you've got uh, curriculum committees. Right. And that goes into even naming. Right. Um, it, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, too, I think, where uh, there's just enough change in a course. Is it substantial enough to need its own new number? So because it is different from what was previously being taught. Right. Yeah. Um, substantive change. It's real. Thinking about that and how are you going to handle that and what does it show? And. Yeah, it's all good stuff. So. This is just a start, you know, don't forget those surveys and rubrics that didn't make it onto the slide, but they're, they're hanging out there. <laughs> well, and if you're looking at this list and you're like scratching your head saying, I've never looked at any of this stuff before, this might be kind of your friendly reminder to take a peek or ask a question about how things are set up and why data is collected that the way it is um, and how you can kind of help with that data stewardship, right? right. Um, Many times we, we aren't aware of the ways in which we are adding 
nonsense, right, or noise into the data, um, whether it's you use, you refer to a student by a nickname rather than their full name, um, you know, uh, you're talking about your courses or writing about your courses or entering information about your courses by the truncated course name versus the long form course name, right? Like short form versus, form versus long form really does create a problem. Or the faculty names, are they uh, initials? Do they include, you know, titles? Right. Um, is it first name, middle initial? Is it just first name? Is it just last name? Is it last name first? <laughs> yeah. I mean, certainly we can make some assumptions, you know, like you, when you work in an institution, you can definitely start to predict like what a new employee email might be, or you're like, oh, I'm going to email a student. I'm going to assume it's Megan.Milchart1 because that's how we do email names here at the institution. But we don't want to make that assumption without knowing for sure that that's like sure. accurately applied every single time. Right, because there are instances where there's already Megan Milchard one, so now I'm Megan Milchard one two, right? Um, right? And then you need you've emailed the wrong student, and everybody who has done that certainly knows the cold sweat of a potential FERPA violation, right? <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> oh. So that kind of leads right to the importance of naming. Um, nomenclature, the way we title things, the way we name our files, all of that is super important. And so this pro tip here, never look at someone else's documents folder. <laughs> the way that I name things would probably make Robin's hair stand on end, hopefully not too much because again, some similar backgrounds there. Um, but whatever is decreed as sort of the nomenclature for your school, and if you haven't thought about that, ding, ding, something to think about how we want to title files, how we want to title courses, how we want to title assessments inside of courses, believe it or not everybody just using exam one every semester for their first exam gets really difficult for you to go in and filter out for example an assessment that maybe you don't want to look at or you need to look at in particular so if you ask everybody to sort of name it in a unique way that helps you to identify that makes it a little bit easier for you to sort through your data so and, and yeah. i like to remind people too one of my favorites is when we say okay we've got our curriculum map and curriculum map new <laughs> <laughs> and those descriptive words that they're meaningful at that very moment in time, but new will become old. Correct. Mm. Right. So I'm like, a, <laughs> I'm a B1, B2, B3 final with a date on it. Like that's, that's my tendency. Um, yeah. Anyway, so, and that's because like all of our databases, every database is built on matching like items to like items, apples to apples. But even though we have a ton of scariness about AI taking over the world, the matrix coming for us, Skynet being installed, whatever it might be with AI these days, computers still aren't smart enough to figure out those inconsistencies and match them up all of the time, right? So we wanna make sure that things are like matched to an ideal like item. So ideal is a student ID, right? Um, some sort of number that is going to be unique as an identifier. At one point I had social security on here and Robin wisely took it off of there because we stopped using those somewhere in 2003, beginning of 2003. So, um, but you know, in any sort of other scenario, maybe when you're doing your taxes, your tax ID is your ideal key ID for identifying who you are. Um, and yeah. generally the institutions have a some kind of governance rule in place yes. for student matching or person matching it's, yes. it's generally called person and non-person matching which i know it seems kind of weird that you're going to have non-persons in your database but think corporations and vendors correct. and stuff like that, yeah. right? um yeah. and there's generally a set of rules that are part of that matching process and so it will be some kind of id it will be some kind of name it will and a few other right. factors beyond that right um, yeah and i've encountered some interesting as i've done these kind of um reports in various locations and and came across uh, my favorite my absolute favorite um and i i guess i was naive or or early enough in my career to think that you know that this kind of thing wouldn't happen but it was a, a husband and a wife uh -huh. with the same name same middle name same last name born on the same day in the same year 
still married, so they were living in the same place, so same address, everything except man and wife. Jen, I mean, I think you have to get married if all of that lines up, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just cosmically, I guess, yes. But it yeah. was my favorite scenario, and it's the only one I've ever seen where every single thing about the two human beings and their record and they said they for forever getting things mixed up yeah um, because well, of everything being very very similar for them and especially if people use like a an initial right as a first name mm -hmm. and and have a similar there are cultures in which you know when women marry right. they take their husband's first name as their middle name right so just right. being you know that also goes to some of that cultural sensitivity it's not just being aware of what your data does right. but it's being aware of what um the humans behind your data represent right so that's why right. i say it's like less ideal to match on that name only because you might have those two people with all of that similar information and you have to keep going and keep going it reminds me of um oh when we learn to like alphabetize or read the card catalog rather <laughs> oh i know right. i know and you may right. you have to keep going one. down when you, when you were talking there, you made me think of another one where it's more of a, and I think of my, I know I've got a Southern accent. I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> and my Southern ear. <laughs> um, but when you think about the potential of when we, we take information over the phone and versus in person and in writing, how some things sound phonetically, the names sound phonetically. Oh, yeah similar but they're very different and so the one i came across was judy j u d y like judy garland versus u ye y u y i you know and that's go that goes to that that cultural difference and you know if you've got somebody that's you know yeah. for whatever reason maybe it's on the phone you didn't understand them there very well you know it's it's different sure. so find that in the data you know and how does that you know it was somebody put judy you know, when they meant you ye somebody corrected it yeah well actually they created a second record and so we had to go through a whole process of merging things together and getting it correct under the right you i wonder i wonder if you ye eventually was like i'm just gonna call myself judy <laughs> which is not the outcome you want for sure know, but like yeah. one you certainly understand happening right yeah, yeah. But just thinking um, about things like that that can happen and that's okay. that goes to that slipping through that we don't even really realize it until it's sometimes too late because we've reported out certain things oh, yeah. it's not connected to something you know where we're trying to collect money or you know yeah well even if it's not just even if it's not at the reporting out phase you know, if you've written or been involved with a self-study, mm -hmm. we start those 18 months in advance sometimes because it's going to take us 16 months to find everything we need to find. That's right. And it's the flurry of emails. It's the multiple meetings. It's the, you know, historical information that you have to go retrieve from other sources or things that never got written down, right? Um, or I would say, you know, something I've observed is like the the pre-accreditation years are still leaking into the accreditation years, right? Where there's like that slow uptake of accreditation. And, right. you know, eventually you're going to have to report on those slow uptake years as if they weren't slow uptake years. You know what I mean? Like you, you really have to kind of start thinking about your processes as they're going to be fully fleshed out and not just keep yourself in this consistent we're still working on it we're still working on it we're still working on it phase because eventually we're still working on it becomes you have to stop okay. working you got to yeah. do and we got to move on to other things and so when we when it comes time to pull all that data that's when all of this work pays off right that's when all of this hard work all of this thought process all of this thought leadership all these arguments over truncation and naming and underscores mm -hmm. and dates pays off in the long run the governance yes, yes. and if you're part of your community's uh governance council if this yes. at all strikes interest with you ask, ask around you know they yeah. be part of that conversation and help make a difference on your campus it will be yeah. appreciated. i mean they might not have, I, I have found they might not appreciate you insistently forcing yourself on
onto a committee, <laughs> the assessment committee. Um, but you know, they'll, they'll hopefully appreciate the work that you do. Yeah, yeah, right. There we go. Uh, <laughs> so just thinking about this consistency, trying to find data if you have fall terms, fall terms that are all named different, fall 23, 2023, FA, capital, FA, mixed, right, capital, lowercase, two digits, yes. It all makes a difference. Course yeah. changes, curriculum changes. We love to revamp, we love to rename, we love to bring things modern. But when we do that, what does that mean for how we used to teach it, how we used to name it, how we used to view right. it? And then the same with our students. Names can be similar, even weirdly spelled and long ones like Megan Milcharik. There are other ones of me out there, believe it or not. <laughs> so. I always want to add either uh, an extra B or change mine to a Y you know oh, so yeah. always they laugh yeah. at me at the registers when they ask my name it's like robin like the bird you know tweet tweet tweet, tweet. yeah <laughs> yeah that's funny <laughs> oh. um, so you know it comes down to like which would you prefer to work with if you had to look at a chart you know across that different offices kept of this data you might find yourself going like how do i even start to reconcile this we don't even know if some of these students are counted across multiple like that 22 fa and fa 22 and fall 2022 and fall 22 i don't actually trust any of that data i don't trust it i don't know if students i don't know if those are all clean buckets is what i'm getting at i don't know if there's any leakage between them if a student is incorrectly registered in one of them and then moved over to another version of it because they registered for a different section class. class yeah, yeah exactly. if drew came back whatever it might be um i i don't trust any of those grand total numbers but on the second one i do because everybody is bucketed correctly and there's only two buckets across the top and one bucket across the side and from the reporting perspective we can tell you how that number was calculated is it a, is it an unduplicated count is it right um is it an average whatever you know we can yeah. tell and um, nobody know. had to spend five ten fifteen i mean let's be honest i've spent upwards of 20 plus hours working with one spreadsheet to oh, reconcile yeah. data Right. And so if you think about like, yes, you yes. know, when you when you hire people who know what they're doing with data, do you want to spend their time cleaning data or do we want to make sure the data is clean so that they can do something with it, which is really what you hired it for. And, you know, I liked to think about the patterns, you know, and crosswalk tables, look up tables yes. that you can use if you know that, let's say you've got parts of term or something like that, or you've got old term formats maybe you went from multiple term codes into a consolidated set and went from like multiple codes showing multiple terms into a single code with parts of term yes but you need to show those longitudinally so you use a a, a lookup table a crosswalk to right. say okay this is where these historical ones fit into the modern structure of things and then you can keep moving forward from there but you can't do it without elegant, first example. You, you know, a, an elegant solution. You know, when you look at the pattern that that you you are presented with, but when you can avoid it on the front end, and like in this case, you know, it's clearly, you know, we've got several different iterations of the same term. Inelegant for sure. All right, same here with student data. Which version of me is the version of me? So can which, you imagine trying to advise this student with what yeah, which, <laughs> which one? I know. Which one's right. I mean, <laughs> and in one of them I look like I am I should be leading the class. And in others I look like I should be like getting some targeted intervention. And is this two humans or is this one human? Is this really all just your record? Right. I you know, the story I have is I I had an, a year at an institution where we had three students named Riley Smith. Yeah. Three. Now there were two spellings of Riley that were the same and one that was different. All three were female. Yeah. The care, the, the, the deliberateness with which I had to make sure I was entering the right grade for the right student, talking, emailing, you know, thinking of the correct student when I looked at a name was burdensome. And think about just correcting the record, how easy it would be to mistakenly put 
a correction on a record you didn't intend to and associate it with yeah. a, with an incorrect student. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've had instances with my own data where, you know, somebody with the same last name left the institution or something like that. And certain pieces of my information went by the wayside with that person, you know, awesome. um, <laughs> you know, so it's, <sighs> it's interesting. Yeah. Now, I do want to call out on, on this, on the table on the left here. Yeah. It doesn't look like the one that's highlighted in orange. It doesn't look like there's anything really wrong there but there's a space at the end of that so you notice it's one record that's sitting out there those are the kind of clues you want to look for and yeah. so megan can you oh, well you're in presentation mode i promise you <laughs> that's intended there is there's a space it's safe at the end and you see yeah. it's highlighting it because it's a space but like we said earlier space is nulls that's actually data so those are characters again anybody who's written a self-study knows the importance of characters and not wasting them or using them unnecessarily of 10,000 characters right. to write, you know, in the, in the uh, cell study for pharmacy. So we are familiar. Right. So same thing with course names, right? Um, a common question we get is I'm not seeing a course. And usually I want to say maybe 50 to 60% of the time, it's somewhere in the undetermined term. And this happens because of assessments and courses that are falling outside of the term dates. So when we talked about those terms okay. earlier, if you're not getting that auto magical load, be very, very careful like that your term dates are matching where you've ended your courses. And know that sometimes if you do some of those fun things to play with it, like extend your course end date in ExamSoft, it might pop it into an undetermined term briefly while we figure things out. Or you give an assessment that goes beyond the end of the term. Right. Remediation or purposes or before the term for a student. Maybe you have a student who's like, I want to test out of the course. Happens infrequently, but sometimes it does, right? Um, we want to make sure that that data is going into the right place, right? So it's making sure that you're lining up, not just naming of like the title of the course, but how you name the dates of the course, how you name the term of the course. Um, and then the same thing when it comes to changing our courses as we change our curriculum. Um, Sometimes we run into where the course ID has completely changed. You've gone from a 400 level to a 600 level, a graduate to a doctorate program. Um, our friends in occupational therapy are likely all going through this right now as mm -hmm. they're preparing to bring in their doctoral students. Um, it certainly happened with the pharmacy when it went from a bachelor's program to a yes. two plus program. Yes. Um, probably with PT too back in the right. 90s where they, they switched over. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we have this example here where actually the course ID is all the same, which is, which is very helpful, but we have different course titles, right? So now what happens with this course? Are they all the same? Are they different enough that we need to consider them as different? Um, do we have a real course here to deal with or do we have um, a, a shell? Like, what are we dealing with here? I don't really know. Is women's health the same as OBGYN? Um, I would imagine OBGYN is the same as obstetrics and gynecology, but there's a lot outside of obstetrics and gynecology that goes into women's health. I would so, say, yeah, so when you're in a data role like that, we don't, we don't always know the details that you know. I can make the assumption that HLT 630 from three years ago when it was called obstetrics and gynecology is exactly the same as HLT 630 women's health, but pro like I can guarantee you there's going to be some issues in there. You know, move that forward to maybe there's a uh, site locations and maybe there's an address where you're still in the same area of a community. Mm -hmm. And you just don't want to create another site code or something like that. Well, what you're by not changing the site code, you're saying that it's happening in the same location as the first time, right? Yes. When, and then when you're reporting out and they go back and they say, well, these new ones are at the same location as the old one, but it doesn't exist anymore, or you don't have an agreement with them. And then you've got to do a whole lot of explaining that's above and beyond what you really needed to do. Yeah. Yeah. 
really not that, that's that an easy to one to mess up um yes as as I, I used to see that a lot on site code. so now what happens if you do both what happens if you revamp your curriculum and everything stays relatively the same we haven't reached substantive change curricular threshold. We've reorganized courses. We've shifted content from one course to another course. We've realigned, right? And we've unveiled this new curriculum, but none of it rises to the occasion of changing the catalog even, right? It's a common right. thing that happens. It's a lot of work to change everything. Um, so sometimes it's just looks like repackage and, and, and shift. So what happens when we get these sort of nightmare scenarios, as I like to call them, where our course ID has changed and our course title has changed, right? So we have pharmacy 342, 344, 345, three, or 346, 43, 45, 44, whatever. Um, and they're all called, well, many of them are called pharmacotherapeutics, but then sometimes there are other there's intro to med chem and then there's intro to pharmacology. I can assume these are different, but mm -hmm. maybe not. <laughs> I would treat yeah. them differently. I would treat right. them differently if I were working with the data set in this case. But then um, I see, to me, I'm looking at 4342 and I'm like, well, maybe it's pharmacotherapeutics one intro to med chemistry. And if I'm sitting in the seat and I know the curriculum well, I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense to me, right? But does it make sense to anybody else? I'd have to call somebody and I would be treating them di differently until I knew. Right, so there are two people who work with data all the time, making two vastly different assumptions and decisions with the data based right. on their view of it. Right. And those are two people who would know the data better than most people on campus. So now trying to get your faculty involved in self-study and we have these different names, this is where we see frustration. This is where we see that the process is bureaucratic. It's too long. It's too much time. It's not worth it. That's where, the, that's where we get all of those complaints and get that bad feeling about accreditation and self-study. Um, I cannot tell you how much I loved being able to be part of a, a process where when they got the data, they knew it had already been vetted enough that it was accurate and they could trust it and then they could write their narrative on it. Yes. And that was a beautiful process to be part of, you know, because we weren't last minute trying to go in and justify and figure out, okay, why does this not look right to us? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it does come up, but it wasn't on the vast scale of just across everything, but. Yeah. And that's your plug to uh, involve your IR department in self-study. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, indeed. Absolutely. So what we say here is like, ideally, there should be something that should say stay similar to ensure that accurate mapping, whether it's the title or the course code, like there needs to be something that stays the same. And this is a great time for a supporting appendix item or an auxiliary document that tells people pharmacy 4342 is pharmacotherapeutics one intro to med chemistry A. Sometimes it's abbreviated as Pharm 1, Pharmacotherapeutics 1, PT1, right? Actually providing the abbreviations or providing what we like to call that data dictionary is really helpful so you get fewer phone calls, fewer emails, and people can understand what they see in front of them. I love the data dictionaries. You know, for folks that are using um, our current data export process, we actually have as part of our knowledge base data dictionaries that go with those files so you know exactly what it is that um, those fields mean. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah, love a data dictionary. So um, we say this is like high risk for institutional knowledge. This is in somebody's head somewhere, keeping it all jumbled. And you know who that person is because I'm saying this and you're bringing them right to mind right now. If you had to call somebody to figure out what the courses were, you know what number you're dialing, you know what email you're sending it to. So we want to avoid institutional knowledge as much as possible because you know, somebody wins the lottery and they leave the institution, there goes the knowledge. That's right. So another version of this. Oh, oh these are. <laughs> yeah. These, yeah, this is our fun. <laughs> where, outside where, the catalog. What, what the heck? You know, sometimes there are times when we need to have some extra data that's not part of the standard, you know, and you've right. got good reason to do it. And 
I would encourage you to make sure that it follows those standards so you know what it belongs with and you know what part of the story it is. Otherwise, right. when you get lines like, oh, it's just remediation, well, remediation for what? I know. I'm looking at remediation, Robin. Like, is that a superhero? <laughs> remediation, Robin. <laughs> I forgot my cape today. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, we see these a lot. I'm not going to lie. I see a lot of those yeah. like remediation professor X, you know. Um, yeah. Team two. How, hmm? team two. Oh, yeah. Team two. Um, oh, well, what yeah. does that what does it go with? What is what? What are you? What is it? Yeah. What team? is it valid? You know, should we be counting it somewhere? Are you going to try to report that out somewhere? Right. Is yep. it, so, or is it just fluff, you know? Remediations, most common one that I see, right? And so for many schools, it's like it's fluff and it might be right now. It, it, where you are in your uh, assessment processes, where you are with how many remediations you actually do, that might be something you don't want to analyze. But if you're a big school, school with frequent remediations, a school of any sort of attrition or matriculation issue, you're going to want to start to assess those at some point in your process, whether it's for the frequency, the outcomes, whatever it might be. So if they're not named correctly, now when it comes time for you to get to that piece of fruit at the top of the tree, you've got all the low hanging ones, you've worked your way up, it's, it's rotten. It's full of worms because you haven't done what you needed to do to cultivate that, right? So it really is like a constant cultivation process. Yeah. High risk institutional knowledge. Robin leaves the institution. Now remediation, Robin goes away. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> I don't know how many students she saved. All right, so the data sources to check regularly. These are the things, whether it's an NFLUX, ExamSoft, Canvas, whatever system you are using. This doesn't have to be specific to ours. These are the things that you should, at this is a great time to do it too. This is why we're doing this right now. Mid-year is a great time to start looking at those things again, right? Because it's kind of your check. You loaded everything in at the start of the semester. You're not really going to look at the, the end results until the end. So this is a really great point to check in with your data stewardship and say, am I up to date as everything the way that I want it to look? And is how, because you're already starting to plan for next year as well, the next academic year. Yeah. So making sure that everything you're aware of how things are getting into your systems, you know, um, what changes might be coming, uh, have that conversation, open it up uh, on campus and find out. Um, and again, I encourage you to think also about your, you know, any surveys that you're doing, whether it's course evaluations or, you know, um, the uh, rubrics or any of the precept or student evaluations that you're doing for clinicals and things like that, take a look at it now, you know, right, exactly. sure that whatever changes you're making have a really good reason behind it. Yes. So the things that we really say that you should check regularly, right, are your student lists. Always check those student lists. Lots of changes happen mid-year. Students don't come back. They get married. Congratulations to them, right? Or, or they get divorced. Yeah. yeah which we're really sorry. Um, we wanna make sure that you know those things are taken care of in there. Your faculty teaching assignments, if you have to do any sort of loading reporting, or you wanna make sure everybody is gonna see the data, be able to see the data, day one for the spring semester, exam one happens, you don't want Professor X calling you up saying, Robin, I can't see the data in the system. Make sure that they are correctly coded into ExamSoft, Canvas, and Flux, wherever they need to be. Oh, and sure. You know, it's those mid-year uh, faculty production, um, official yes. instructor of record questions, your credentialing, you know, maybe you're bringing in people you haven't worked with before, you've got to check those faculty credentials, all of that's part of your accreditation. Yes, yes it is, absolutely. Um, your mentor and mentee assignments. You know, other things that happen at mid-year is sometimes faculty leave for other jobs. Um, they get promotions, they take on more responsibilities and have to give up their mentees for whatever reason. So you might have to go in and make sure that you make these, those association changes so that the new advisor is ready to go and help the students from day one. You don't wanna have that lag time of they can't see the information that they need to see so that they can help the students at the point that they need it. Um, course rosters, right? So if you are not an auto magical load, how often do you sync your data into ExamSoft? 
So that's the, if you're an EDU user who does not connect directly to your SIS or to your LMS, your student information or your learning management systems, you're going to want to make sure your rosters are correct. Students withdraw, students are added. Fun fact, your financial aid office reaches out to people across campus for return of Title IV funds regulation, yes. where they have to report last date of attendance. And many times it's those test records that right. um, our assignment records that give them that last date of attendance for those students and whether they're having to return federal, um, yeah. federal monies. Yeah, those years of uh, withdrawing from your class and keeping your federal financial aid, are, they're gone. They're gone. They're gone. Yeah. They, they want the money back, right? Um, current versus archived categories. Another thing we run into often is, you know, we have users go in and look at required categories to look for their tagging fidelity. And they're like, I don't see this category. We had no idea the category was updated. We put in what your tree looks like, but it's not, that's not automatically loaded at this current phase state. So in order for that to be updated, simple email to Megan at NFLUX, Jake at NFLUX. Hey, I have new categories in my system. Can you go ahead and load them into yours? We can actually go look at, at ExamSoft. We can't build anything in there, which is awesome, but we can go make sure that we have those synced up correctly for you. Um, but making sure that you are, before you even tell us that you have those categories in there, making sure that you are pulling back the ones you don't want faculty to use, keeping them from their view, putting in any new categories, whether by mandate or by school design. COPA's coming for those who are in pharmacy, for example, that might be a big change for many of you. Um, if we have pharmacy individuals here or occupational therapy and nursing, our other programs that have new competencies. So making sure that we're getting those um, updated in ExamSoft for faculty use and in Canvas if you're using them there and then updated in NFLUX so we can match all that data up. Committee committees is also important because it um, in, in, in terms of influx it it actually controls permissions to reporting in many cases. Yep. Um, and those change regularly and quite often. So make sure that those yes. are up to date. And that's, I mean, admin access, right? Like if somebody has committee membership inside of NFLUX, they have admin access to everything. So if you don't want them to have that anymore, it's really important that you check that membership, right? Category tagging, how much tagging is missing? This is a great time to check in on category tagging. What happened during the fall and how much back work do we have to do? Let's not wait till the end and do all the back work. It's, it just takes longer and it gets too far out of people's minds, right? Out of sight, out of mind for too long. Help future you, as I like to say. When I find something that I have done well in the past, I always like to say that past Megan was looking out for future Megan. And that's really what you want to have set up. You want, you want to be in the future saying, oh my gosh, I really appreciate the version of me that did this the right way back then. Because we all know the experience of cursing past Megan or past Robin or past whomever you are, whatever your name is, because you didn't do the right thing the first time when you set things up, right? Um, why so this, why? <laughs> why did I do that, right? And then the other part that we, like we think of this from a compliance and accreditation mindset, we have eight years, we have eight years. I have time, I have time, I have time. We don't with your students. So if you're using any of this data to talk to your students about how they're doing, prepare them for boards, they don't have the luxury of eight years of your time to wait for it to be correct. They need it to be correct now because they're basing decisions on it now. So we wanna make sure we're giving them the most accurate information. And not only them, you're also think about the curricular uh, implications when you're talking about outcomes and stuff and you look at what you're teaching, what you're not teaching. You know, if you wait too long, you've got a whole segment that you're potentially missing. Exactly. Well, internal assessment and regular review items. So this goes really to if you're doing this regularly, you're reviewing grades being posted, the pass rates for your courses at the end of semesters. These are quick, quick checks. We know the university tells us there's a date by which the grades have to be posted, right? So we know that there is a drop dead date that we can start looking at this information. And that's usually within a reasonable amount of time. So we can ascertain, did we get all of our grades posted? Did we have a good pass rate? That's a typical assessment plan item. We want a 90 to 95% pass rate. We wanna reduce remediations. Outlier grades, everybody passed except for a really bad grade or nobody passed except for one outstanding grade. 
for everybody passed. This course is an outlier course. Everybody got a 4.0 and that's not typical. And then the remediations and the retakes. If we're doing all of this now, if we're regularly checking in when it comes time to comply with either our dean's request, our assessment committee's request, um, we have it there and ready to go because we've made sure it's built correctly and we've been checking it regularly for Imogen. <laughs> so, right, so that again gets to anyone you have to report to. If you do all of this, if we, if we engage in this process of making sure that we are virtually just assessing our own fidelity to the data, we should be able to report anywhere with ease up through your dean and your program there shouldn't be a question too difficult to answer in terms of either the complexity of the question or the ability to grab the data it should be there at your fingertips within a reasonable amount of clicks or shuffles through a file cabinet so things you might have to talk about semester and academic year outcomes if you've built things correctly if it's faithful and there's good quality to it you can talk about that student attrition names match up we don't have duplicates we have accurate cohort numbers, pass rates and graduation rates, college strategic plan. These are all things we report to our dean and our program about. Course evaluations, board exams, survey results. Right, and that should it's a be the university version. You know, right. the intention is not to make you redo a whole lot of work. It should dovetail nicely into the next layer up. Yes. Um, and then so that's important to remember you know you're uh, in most cases you are not asked to just reinvent the wheel every time you're having to explain something correct yeah um and again same to the outside accreditors so right. all should i call it roll up it should all roll up nicely into like a little scroll if you think about it that way right yeah. wrap it up um or something i would do crosswalking is if i made an assess if i make an assessment plan i generally crosswalk it to program standards, university strategic plan, outside accreditor standards. So I can see across all of these three layers why I'm collecting this data, because it goes here, it goes here, and it goes here. And then anybody who looks at the assessment plans can see the use and the utility of the data that I'm asking them to grab. Nothing worse than sending people out on a goose, like a, a wild goose chase, and not giving them any reason for why you use the data, or worse, collecting the data, saying, thanks, bud, and throwing it into a drawer and never doing anything with it. Exactly. We want to make it meaningful. We want to make it real. Exactly right. So document, that brings us to document. When in doubt, write it out. I love that one, Robin. When in doubt. We always yeah. talk brainstorming and brain dumping. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just, it's okay. Get it all out, get it all down, write it down. And, you know, um, my former boss, his, one of his favorite sayings during like the one in five year program review it's like we all do assessment we all do it all the time every day sometimes we're at the water cooler and we're right. talking to somebody hey you know have you had a trouble with whatever process oh yeah i have you know and you talk it out you say well why don't we try da 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 and you know you end up with a plan a or a plan b and it's like yeah that sounds great and then you yeah. go off and you do it and you've done assessment you just have to write it down <laughs> somewhere yeah you just you know? have to write it down so yeah. I've switched over to our demo environment to show you how you can just write it down yeah. inside of nflux without having to worry about it and that's our action plans we talk about these through using them in a dashboard all the time and that's the super simple way to do it I saw a thing I want to grab it and I want to make sure that I put it for later but what about those water cooler conversations what about those write them down moments what about those big initiatives you can create an action plan just to create an action plan, just to document a thing. And it can be as simple as conversation with Robin about a new process for documenting um, student name changes. Uh, let's say flesh out and bring to leadership. That can literally be it. Just a little note to yourself, a little note to you and Robin. Hey, we had this really awesome conversation and I want to make sure that we get it down on paper. We flesh it out. We see what we created from it. And that simple thing is honestly, this 
is a documented process that you did across your self-study period. And right? it'll, be, it'll be time stamped. And you can put the, the person you were speaking with as a collaborator. As a collaborator. That yep. you are both in there. You know, yes. talking about you are the assignee. Conversating back and forth using our comments, making it actionable allows you to say, we have, when it comes to that due date, we did what we wanted to do. We met our goal. Or, and you know we, what? And that day we said it. we were going to follow back in a month and see how it was going. Well, this is my reminder. To this follow is my back. reminder to follow back. Right. So action plans can be as big as I have seen an insight in the dashboard that I need to document for this committee meeting. It's big, 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 important stuff, right? Uh, we like to talk about the big important stuff, but it's the little tiny things that fall through the cracks that actually make the big important things happen and make them more realistic. So if you're having these water cooler conversations, if you're having these side conversations, if you know you need to take a look at something in three months, write it down and don't forget about it. Let the system remind you. It can be a note to yourself. I used them all the time when I was teaching. I need to go back and look at outcomes. I need to go back and re-review course uh, questions to make sure that I want to keep using this stuff. And I don't want to look at it now when I just finished teaching. I want to look at it closer to the time of teaching. So don't let those things slip out of your brain. Don't let the sticky note fall off of your desk. Don't stick it in a notebook somewhere and forget about it in between meetings document it here assign yourself a due date keep yourself accountable and think about the use of your labels too because then you can see how many of these things are happening in common groups so correct of, you know is it, a, is it the same course is it a group of courses that we've been watching in general anyway you know and yeah. you that out and say oh look there's five different action plans that we've got for these two courses that are very similar to each other how are they going to and when it comes time to how are we doing on those initiatives, on those action plans, how am I doing and meeting the things that I said I would do? It's a simple view here. I'm on, I'm open and late. I'm closed and I met, I didn't meet my goal. I dropped, I missed the mark on that one. I want to revamp it. It's open. I'm still working on it. We're good. We're good to go. Or I finished it and I did what I wanted to do, right? So we have all these really quick ways of you being able to assess, am I on track with where I want to be? And that can be as a committee, as an individual, all different ways that you can slice that to look at those action plans to make sure that these conversations, these little things that create such big problems later on are either cared for regularly or don't fall by the wayside and they're a problem. And I think one of the, the most telling things that I learned at one of the conferences I went to is that when, when we're talking about goals and whether or not we meet them, the ones that we don't meet are just yes. as important as the ones that we do meet. And sometimes um, it's that fact that we are taking a look at it critically and we're recognizing that we can do something better. And then it is doing something about it. Is that a great story? Find it, do something about it. And then did it work or not? If it didn't work, that's okay. But what are you, what's, what's plan C? Right. And then, so this becomes a storyteller that you mm -hmm. don't have to spend a lot of time finding the story for. Yeah, exactly. So at this point, Megan, this has been fun. I like talking data quality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like this. This is a lot of fun. I want to do this again. So at this point, we're going to leave time for questions um, in the Q&A and we will answer any that you have. We're also available. I mean, me more than I'm going to gatekeep Robin here a little bit. She has so much to do in making sure that the data looks beautiful inside of your dashboards. If you have follow up questions or, you know, you want to talk about something in more detail, even if it is with Robin and myself, email me, Megan at NFLUX, and I'll make sure that it gets to Robin. I'll make sure that she is in the room with us to have any of those conversations, um, but certainly to give her brain the space to think creatively and, and build those beautiful Always things love for us. Brain. Always yeah. love, yes. Absolutely, so we'll leave the chat up, or the Q&A up here for a little bit.